I really believe that God wants to speak to you specifically today. We don't come and open the Bible to become smarter sinners or just to learn more facts about the ancient world. God actually wants to do work in your heart. He wants to heal. He wants to change. Uh, he wants to bring renewal. And so as we come to God's word, I'm going to pray in just a moment. And we're going to ask for his help as we try and put away the distractions of the week and listen to the Lord. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray now as we engage with it that you might indeed speak words of hope to those who are discouraged, that you would speak words of challenge to those who are comfortable, that you would speak words of truth to those believing the false lies of this world. For we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, in 2006, a few unusual bloody noses had me going to the doctor's. Uh, I, at the time, was a young man who avoided doctors at all costs, but because of these unusual bloody noses, uh, I needed to go and to get looked at. So I went to an ear, nose and throat specialist, and in essence, the outcome was not what I expected. I was diagnosed with a very rare type of blood cancer, one called natural killer cell lymphoma. And the doctor explained to me that I would go through a period of chemotherapy, I would go through radiation, I would go through an autologous transplant over the next years. It was not a diagnosis that I saw coming, and it was a very despairing and distressing time, both for my pregnant wife and also for myself. But there was a ray of hope, even in the midst of a very difficult treatment. You see, when I was unhealthy with no hair, my daughter was born, Zara Lily, and there we can see her. She came out healthy with a good mop of hair. And I thought, this is so unfair. But you'll see there, I did have something of a smile, but that smile was actually not reflective of my life situation. You see, I was going through a really hard time and I had really deep needs at that time. But there are moments in my life, and I hope you have to never go through anything like that or a loved one, but the reality is, in our world, in our life, in our day-to-day living, we are all going to go through difficult experiences where we're going to have deep needs within us, and the question that we will uh, look at is how those needs are met. You see, there are going to be situations in your life where the world seems darker, times are less certain. And it's going to feel like there are needs that aren't being met. Now, sometimes this comes generally because we live in a difficult world. Uh, We might sometimes have a a disappointing experience at work through no fault of our own. It could be that we go through financial hardship. It could be that we do receive a medical diagnosis or uh, there might be a loved one who dies. And that's not because we've done something necessarily. It's because we live in a broken world. But the reality is it creates within us a deep need for healing. There are some decisions, however, that we make and some things that occur in our life because of bad decisions that we make. Sometimes we go through difficulties of a painful relationship, a breakdown with our kids or grandkids. Sometimes a relationship might end in a difficult divorce. There might be a breakdown in our physical or mental health. Sometimes that comes just because we live in a broken world, but sometimes we contribute to it. For the people of Judah, their deep need at the time of Jeremiah was security. They were facing a very uncertain future and there were people banging on their door, the Babylonians, who were threatening to remove them forcibly from their homes, to capture them, to kill them, and they were hoping for deliverance. The people of God were undergoing a tough examination and they were going through their own moments of deepest need. And the question the word of the law will put before them and the question for us this morning as we come to this portion of Jeremiah is the same. What do you trust in to meet your deepest needs? What do you trust in to meet your deepest needs? Because there will be moments in your life that you'll experience hardship and what will you do during those times? 
Well, again, we go to Jeremiah chapter 17 where this question is going to be answered and we have the very real prospect of invasion from an external army, the Babylonians, it's going to take place here. But we're going to see the crisis, the the big situation for the people of God. He was actually being brought on because of their own rebellion. They have strayed against God. They have uh, gone after idols as we saw last week. And it's in the middle of that that God sends this man, Jeremiah, with this message of judgment and hope. As we said last time, the key message from Jeremiah, uh, the whole book could be described this way. Jeremiah 1 verse 10. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Much of the book of Jeremiah has been about judgment. What happens when we as humans rebel against God and go after our own ways? And we're going to see how seriously God takes our rebellion against him. But also, as we saw last week, there are two positive things. God wants to build and he wants to plant. And if you were here last week, we looked at the reality that God wants to jackhammer away the falsehood in our life, the belief in idols. But then he wants to lay a firm foundation in his character. Well, today we're going to come to a planting metaphor where we're going to get some images that are going to help us think about how we might trust in God during our time of deep need. This section of Jeremiah is going to give do two things. He's going to give us a negative warning or what we call a prohibition, but then he's also going to give us a positive message of encouragement. But both of these needs are going to deal and help us think through how we might respond in our moments of deepest need. So first, let's look at the warning. Look at verses five and six with me. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. Now, I don't know if you noticed it there, but did you pick up how strong that language is? Cursed is the one who trusts in the man. Now, you notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say the Lord says, disappointed is the one who trusts in man. It doesn't say it's kind of dumb to trust in man. It's a little bit silly to follow man. No, the law wants to make it really clear that cursed is the one who trusts in man. This is a mistake to put in your moments of deepest need, trust in humanity. And I think if I was to summarize this first section in verses five and six, it would be this. This is the the word of warning to you this morning. Don't trust in humanity to meet your deepest needs. Don't trust in humanity to meet your deepest needs. There's a couple of reasons for that. And I say humanity, it's not just people out there, but it's don't trust in yourself as part of that humanity. There's a couple of reasons. First of all, humans disappoint because we are finite. The reason we don't trust in humans is because we are finite. There is a limit to what we can do. Again, verse five, this is what the Lord says, cursed is the one who trusts in man. The people of Judah had gone through an extended period where they trusted a variety of things. They had trusted along the way the idols of the nations, which didn't bring any peace, but they also trusted in the leadership of their day who was utterly corrupt and the ones promoting idols. People like Jehoiakim, people like Zedekiah, They trusted in these others thinking, we have deep needs, we've got security issues, we've got peace issues, we're going to trust in people to solve our major problems. Now, I would suggest to you today, there is nothing wrong with voting. There is nothing wrong with getting behind governments. There is nothing wrong with pushing for rulers who are moral and upright. But I want to tell you today, the biggest needs that you have, the deepest needs that you need met will not be solved by humanity. Governments, leaders, politicians, hear me correctly, they all have their place and we want to prayerfully as godly citizens live well in our society. But if we are looking externally for the world to meet our deepest problems, we are going to be disappointed. 
Cursed is the one who trusts in the man. Humans disappoint because we are finite. Even the best of men are men at best. And the Lord here provides a strong word. Don't trust in humans. Again, verse 5, we see a second thing. Humanity disappoints because we're foolish. The reason we don't trust in humanity is because we're actually foolish. Second half of verse 5, Cursed is the one who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. When we think that we and even our culture, we have the problems and the solutions to the world's problems... We think that we know that we have the answers. That is when we are doomed for failure. And yet this is what happens. We both culturally, collectively, but individually, our hearts foolishly turn away from the Lord and we believe the lie that we think that we are wiser than God. There's many ways that we do this, even as a culture, but maybe even you as an individual. When we think, I know what God says about marriage, I know what he says. It's between a male and a female forever under him. I know what it says, but who are we to make those decisions? Why don't we come up with a different way of viewing marriage? We follow our own hearts and turn away from the Lord. We think differently. We say, you know what? I know God created male and female, but if you want to choose what gender you can be, you're free to do it. And we think we are wiser than God. I will tell you today, it doesn't end well. When we say, I know what God says about greed. I know what he says about lust. I know what he says about anger, but I actually want to do things my way. When we turn away from the Lord, and trust our own wisdom, it does not end well. Cursed is the one who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Humanity disappoints us in our moments of deepest need because we are foolish. We believe that we are smarter and wiser than God. But thirdly, humanity disappoints us because we're self-deceived. We're self-deceived. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, some of you would have seen this before. This is one of the mantras of our day. Follow your heart. This verse says, dun dun, that is the wrong answer. Do not follow your heart. Your heart is deceived. Your heart is not as pure as you think. Your heart is not always motivated by the right things. The heart is deceitful and above cure. If you think your deepest needs in life, be that a broken relationship, be that an illness, be that something else, if you think that you have all the answers and the answer lies within and you just need to follow your heart, I want to tell you today, you will be disappointed. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. Do not trust your own heart as ultimately being the thing that will bring you satisfaction and significance in life. Now, to ram home his point here, he picks up a metaphor that's agricultural. As I said, the two positive things in Jeremiah that God's word is going to do, it's going to build up and it's going to plant. Well, here he's going to use a planting metaphor, but he first of all gives it negatively in regards to the warning. Look at verse 6. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. Now, if you were to go down to the Dead Sea area in ancient Israel, as even today, you'd find that almost nothing grows in this area. The salt uh, in the soil allows nothing to grow. Uh, There's very little rain, and as a result, there is very little life. You won't find many trees down there, but you will, if you go far enough, you will find one type of tree. It's a spindly tree, a bush in a wasteland, it's called here. It's called the acacia tree. And the acacia tree sits out there by itself, and even there, this is a healthy acacia tree, but look how ghastly it is. It sits there alone. There's, There's useless 
There's not even much shade that it provides. But this is what God's word says. It is like when we trust in ourselves to solve our own problems. We're like this sort of tree. Now, a couple of things we observe about this sort of tree. There is no fruitful outcome. This tree doesn't produce pomegranates. It doesn't produce figs. It's in the wrong world and it doesn't produce God's best gift of mangoes. Okay, there is no fruit that comes from this. This is a useless tree. But more than that, the second problem with this bush in the wasteland is that there is no ongoing sustenance. This, they get very little rainfall down in the Dead Sea region and because of the, the salt in the soil and, and the lack of water about, these things just have a really hard time growing. There is no ongoing sustenance. There is no ongoing life. Now, last year, uh, I went to uh, visit uh, one of my uh, buddies, an old MBMer, Scott Lavender. And some of you remember Scott. And I went out to see Scott at his house in Warrington. And the week before, Scott had been excited. He was doing some backyard renovations and he laid some turf. Got some good soil out there and, and he ordered in this turf from somewhere or other and he laid it and it was fantastic. However, poor Scotty Lavender, his timing was off. You see, he didn't know that a week later after laying the soil, there would be about five or six days in a row of 40 plus degrees. And quickly his soil went from green to being not so green. That was because even though he put some water, even though there's a little bit of soil, even though it looked good from the external because there was no root, because there was no ongoing sustenance, it dried up. And friends, this is the problem when you trust in yourself or you trust in others to solve your problems. There is no continual, perpetual, ongoing life and root system that is going to provide you ultimately with what you need. You're like an acacia bush, a bush in the wasteland. But a third thing about the tree that you notice when you, you're down in the Dead Sea and you see a tree like this, it stands by itself. It looks like a lonely tree. One that's there by itself, there provides very little shade. And this, all these things point to a very negative picture. When you go through your deepest needs, and this is the warning for Judah, you're going through your deepest moments, what are you going to trust? Trust in yourself? You're going to be like a tree that's out there withering. It's not fruitful, there's no life, and you're going to feel very alone. God's warning, don't trust in humanity to meet your deepest needs. But then positively, he's going to tell us and give us ex exhortation in verses seven to eight that I would summarize this way, trust in the Lord to meet your deepest needs. Trust in, your Lord, in, in the Lord to meet your deepest needs. Here, as he regularly does, he puts a big contrast. Last week, it was idols versus the true and living God. Here, it's the, it's the tree in the wasteland versus, as we'll see, a living tree. It's trusting in yourself or it's trusting in the Lord. Look at verse seven. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Here we have this massive contrast, a bush in the wasteland, spindly, no life, no fruit by itself. And then he's going to show us a different sort of tree. And this is actually from the north of Israel up in the Galilee, moving up towards Mount Hermon where the snow would come down, the river, the Jordan River would begin and you find waterfalls and you find lush water. And he's going to show that we, uh, the God's people, when we trust in him, this is the sort of tree that God produces. This is the sort of thing that he does. And he makes a contrast, and perhaps he'd read Psalm 1 that day, we're not entirely sure. But he says, this is the person who trusts in the Lord. They have ongoing strength. They have ongoing strength in contrast to the tree that has no life. We have gushes of water spiritually that keep us going even in the midst of our difficulty. Verse eight, they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out it, its roots by the stream. In contrast 
to the, the spindly tree that had no life. When we trust our deepest needs and we put our roots deep down into God's character and the promises of God, we discover his ongoing and his unending strength to face life no matter what our deepest struggle. You see, the person who trusts in the Lord has ongoing strength. But secondly, the person who trusts in the Lord is fruitful. Remember the spindly tree? It's producing nothing. But what do we see? We see that the righteous, its leaves are always green and never fails to bear fruit. You see, just as good soil and a well-watered plant produces fruit, there are signs to the person who says, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to put my roots down deep. I know this is a struggle, whether it's a physical struggle, a mental struggle. I know that this is a, a difficult time, but I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm not going to follow my heart. I'm not going to follow somebody else, but I'm going to trust in the Lord. When we do that, God does something within us to produce fruit that is going to be for his glory and good for us. And just like pomegranates on a vine that is near a river, so God does a work in our lives. When in moments of doubt and discouragement, we turn to the Lord, he produces within us faith. He produces within us joy. In moments where we feel anxious, where we feel stressed, when we lean into the Lord and lean upon the Lord, he produces fruit within us, steadfastness, peace. When in moments of fear and sorrow, we trust the Lord, he produces within us strength and hope. You see, the person who trusts in the Lord has not only an ongoing source of strength, but it's because of that strength that they then produce fruit that God does something good in their life. But we also see that the person who trusts in the Lord is stable even in the midst of difficulty. The person is stable even in the midst of difficulty. Do you notice again what it says in verse eight about the tree? It does not fear when the heat comes. It has no worries in a year of drought. In this word of the Lord that comes from Jeremiah, God does not promise to take away heat. It is not actually promised to take away drought. And this is the reality that we go through periods of life that are stressful, that are challenging. And God doesn't remove all of those barriers. You see, Christians are not immune to cancer. Christians are not immune to mental health challenges. Christians are not immune to relationship breakdown or death. The heat and the drought do exist in our world and they exist in your life experience. But the good news here that is presented is that when we put down our roots into God, when we trust him for our ongoing support, we don't fear when the heat comes. It has no worries in a year of drought. Why? Because we know the Lord's got it under control. We can actually go to bed at night trusting the Lord even when things are difficult, because we know that we are stable in the hands of God. Friends, in this passage, the key indicator is where one puts their trust. Do you trust in yourself, in humanity, or do you trust in the Lord? This passage reminds us not to trust in humanity, not to look within our hearts to find our deepest needs, but to trust in the Lord. Well, we might say, that sounds good, Malcolm, but I know my own heart. And something even scarier, look at verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Now, many of us would like to say, Malcolm, I'm not, I really am not trying to trust myself, my heart. I, I know that I'm inadequate. I'm trying to trust the Lord. And we, we do. We, we really prayerfully come to God. But the reality is we know that there are times in our life where we don't put our roots down, that we do go back to looking in ourself for answers. And the reality is we all deserve judgment. We all at points in our life are like the spindly acacia tree out in the wastelands. And you might even feel like that today. You feel like, well, you know what? I deserve judgment because I keep going back to things that I shouldn't. The Bible recognizes that judgment is deserved. 
But fortunately for us, God has done something. The God who sees your heart, the God who knows that your heart wants to keep wandering back has done something about it. And he did something by doing something on a tree. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 21. If someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, the body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. You must bury the body that same day for anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. You see, the reality is that the tree, the one in the waste, represented judgment. And we know that Jesus comes and in his life, he lives the perfect life. He is the tree true who flourishes. Yet when he dies upon a tree, when he dies upon a cross, he undergoes the judgment that you deserve, that I deserve. The Bible says in the Isaiah, another prophet, the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jeremiah knew that we needed this grace. Jeremiah 17, verse 14. After getting through this passage, he says, Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed, and I will be saved, for you are the one I praised. Brothers and sisters, fortunately for us, on the cross, Jesus experienced our judgment upon that abandoned tree so that we might flourish in the ongoing strength of God's grace. So let me ask you today, what do you trust in to meet your deepest needs? What do you trust in to meet your deepest needs? Do you trust your bank account? Do you trust your relationships? Are you trusting in your own good health, your own mental strength? This passage comes with a warning. Don't trust your own wisdom. Rather, in contrast, trust in the Lord to meet your deepest needs. Fortunately for us, we trust in the Lord Jesus as the ongoing source of our life. Listen to what Jesus said about himself. He said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. There is our ongoing strength during times of trial. That is the one in whom we find life. Listen again to the words of Jesus to his friends in John 15. Jesus said, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you want to flourish, even in the midst of heat and drought, it will be because you put your roots deep down into Jesus. You abide in his words. Friends, the Bible, I don't know if you know this, starts with a tree. And in that tree, we know what happens. We take from the forbidden fruit, the net result is judgment and ultimately death. But it might surprise you, but the Bible also ends in another tree. In fact, it ends with a tree with a river of life. Listen to Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the water of life the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Brothers and sisters, right now, many of you are living in drought and heat because of stresses, because of difficulties, because of deep pain. I want to tell you today, that's not the end of the story. You see, God will renew. But for now, he won't remove those challenges. But he wants to see in those challenges, what will you trust? Or rather, who will you trust? What do you trust in to meet your deepest needs? Don't trust in humanity, but rather Trust in the Lord. Let me pray. Father, we come to you as dependent people. Lord, so often our hearts are prone to wander, to abandon you, to seek answers within ourselves. But Lord, I pray that in our day-to-day living, that we would walk in step with you, trusting in your son, the Lord Jesus, 
the one who provides living water, sustenance for us, the one who produces fruit as we lay our roots down deeply into him. Forgive us, Lord, for so often depending upon ourselves and help us this week to trust in you for Jesus' sake. Amen.